welcome to the second module of this course uh, mechanics of fiber reinforced composite structures. Uh, this module is basically uh, on review of elasticity and in this module we will have two lectures and uh, we will basically uh, cover the generalized Hooke's law, then we will have a brief introduction to anisotropic elasticity, then we have uh, we will discuss under anisotropic elasticity the constitutive relations, then we will uh, discuss the defined types of materials like triclinic, monoclinic, orthotropic and isotropic with reference to the existence of planes of material property symmetry and then we will try to have a uh, detailed understanding of the engineering constants for orthotropic material. So, before we actually proceed to this uh, uh, review of 3D elasticity, let us uh, recapitulate a quick re uh, recapitulation of what we have actually done in the last module. We have discussed in details the in uh, the broadly what is composite materials and uh, the fiber reinforced polymer composites in particular and then uh, we had a, uh, a detailed discussions on uh, the FRP composites where we understood the basic constituents as fiber and the matrix. Then we understood what is actually a lamina and uh, we discussed that lamina is actually heterogeneous and anisotropic. Then number of lamina stacked together forms a laminate which actually serves as a component in an FRP composite structures. Then we understood what exactly is macro mechanics and micro mechanics of lamina, then macro mechanics of laminate and then uh, as a part of this course we also had a brief discussion that what exactly we will be doing in failure analysis of laminates. Now because the laminate being the component of an FRP composite structure uh, is in the form of a laminate and laminate is actually made up of uh, number of lamina stacked together. Therefore, understanding the mechanics both micro and macro mechanics of lamina is prerequisite to understand the mechanics of laminate and hence to understand the mechanics of fiber reinforced polymer composite structures. Now, we have uh, uh, had a brief discussion that lamina is heterogeneous and anisotropic the fact that a lamina is anisotropic that means the properties are, di uh, properties are direction dependent. Therefore, we need to, to understand the mechanics of lamina we need to have uh, uh, need to understand anisotropic elasticity. So, today we will have a discussion on uh, uh, anisotropic elasticity. Before actually we go to anisotropic elasticity let us have a refresh of what exactly we learnt in our strength of material or solid mechanics course about 3D stresses and strains. We all know that in a loaded uh, object suppose if you have a loaded object uh, with reference to a coordinate a Cartesian coordinate frame x say y and z we can define the state of stress at a point in a definable solid which is subjected to loads and with reference to three mutually perpendicular planes at a point we can actually define the state of stress and we know that in each plane like in this case on the on x plane we have normal stress sigma x and two shear stresses tau x y and tau x z. Similarly, on the y plane we have normal stress sigma y and two shear stresses tau y x and tau y z. Similarly, in the z plane we have normal stress sigma z and shear stresses tau z x and tau z y. That means, on each plane we have three, three stresses one normal and two shear stresses. Therefore, on three mutually perpendicular planes we have nine stress components okay. and similarly we have nine strain components. Okay. And uh, of course, we know that the equality of cross shear because tau equality of cross shear means uh, tau x y is equal to tau y x, tau y z is equal to tau z y and tau z x is equal to tau x z that makes that only 6 stress component symmetric stress component and corresponding 6 strain components. Now, when you characterize the material basically we, we like to understand subjected to stresses what are the strains and vice versa. Okay. So, this mechanical characterization and uh, before we actually go to generalized Hooke's law uh, let us actually try to understand uh, what we already know like 
you know that in a three dimensional stress strain suppose uh, a component is subjected to the stresses say normal stress sigma x sigma y sigma z and shear stresses tau y z tau z x and tau x y. So, what happens we know that if you apply only sigma x that leads to a strain along x which is sigma x by e. If you apply only sigma y then you will have a strain along y which is sigma y by e that is by Hooke's law. Similarly, a strain due to sigma z along z is sigma z by e, but associated to this there are Poisson's effect. Therefore, the fact that sigma x is actually uh, applied along x also causes a strain along y which is given by Poisson's effect and this is minus nu into sigma x by e. Similarly, it also produces a strain along z direction which is minus nu sigma x by e. So, the sigma x along x not only produces strains along x sig epsilon x, it also produces lateral strain along y and z direction. So, all these three normal stress components in addition to producing strains along x, y and z direction, it also produces due to Poisson's effect the strains along other directions. Okay. So, we can write this as the total strain along x normal strains along x, y and z because of sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. Similarly, we also know that a, a shear stress tau x, y in the x, y plane leads to shear strain gamma x, y and they are related by shear modulus. Similarly, tau y, z and gamma y, z, tau z, x and gamma z, x. So, we can write this actually in this form. We can write this in this form that epsilon x, epsilon y, epsilon z, gamma y z, gamma z x, gamma x y is equal to okay, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z tau y z tau z x tau x y and you know what what are the what are the elements of this matrix the first element here will be 1 by e the next element will be minus nu by e so so on minus nu by e 0 0 0 so we can write all the all these elements so in short what you can write is that six components of strains are actually related to the six components of corresponding stresses by means of a 6 by 6 matrix. And that is how if we know the elements of this mat matrix then we can actually characterize this material. And similarly, we can also just taking this inverse we can write the stresses in terms of strains and therefore, this is equivalent to writing that six components of stresses could actually be expressed by a 6 by 6 matrix and six components of strains. Okay. So, this is what is a actually the relation between the stresses and strains which we know already for isotropic material in three dimension we, we can clearly understand how this is obtained. Okay. But what I was trying to emphasize here is that what exactly we mean by when we write the six components of stresses are related to six components of strain by a 6 by 6 matrix or taking inverse you can write stresses in terms of strains or strains in terms of stresses. And so, having understood this just I wanted to actually refresh what we you actually know from your solid mechanics course. Now, we will write the generalized Hooke's law all of us know Hooke's law. So, Hooke's law in three dimensions could be written as written like this where nine components of stresses these actually nine by one stress are related to nine components of strains by means of a matrix nine by nine. Now, you understand what this matrix actually means because just now we had a discussion with reference to an isotropic material. Now, this is a generalized Hooke's law that means all the components of stresses could be actually 
expressed in terms of all the components of strains by means of linear relationship. So, this is called generalized Hooke's law in three dimensions. Similarly, we can write the strains in terms of stresses. Okay. So, this C matrix is called the stiffness matrix okay, and this S matrix is known as compliance matrix. The stiffness matrix is when stresses are ex expressed in terms of strains and the compliance matrix when the strains are expressed in terms of stresses. Okay. So, in general if we have 9 stress components and 9 strain components, we understood what are those 9 stress component and 9 strain components in a Cartesian coordinate at a point we need 3 mutually perpendicular planes to completely specify the state of stress because on each, each plane there could be 3 stresses 1 normal and 2 uh, shear stresses. Therefore, there will be 9 stress components and corresponding 9 stress com strain components and they could be related by means of 9 by 9 matrix therefore, 81 elastic constants the elements are known as elastic constant 81 elastic constants are required to fully characterize the material. Okay. If we really want to know subjected to strains what are the stresses then we need to know these 81 elastic constants. Okay. So, this is generalized Hooke's law I mean if you just suppose I write say sigma x it will take this form C sorry uh, this is actually an index notation therefore, when I write this is a, a stress is a second order tensor therefore, there will it will be 3 to the power 2 in 3 dimension 9 strain stress components and similarly strain is a second order tensor and it will have 9 components and this stiffness is actually a fourth order tensor therefore, it will have 3 to the power 4 81 elastic constants. So, if you know index notation you can actually expand this. So, I am not uh, going into details of this here. Uh, so, uh, having understood this uh, stress strain relationship now we will write the generalized uh, Hooke's law relating to stresses and strains uh, in terms of uh, we can write the stresses sigma ij to the corresponding strains uh, epsilon k l. Now, this is actually uh, written in the index notation. So, stress being a second order tensor. So, this uh, in index notation this i j means there will be 9 stress components 3 to the in 3 dimension there will be 3 to the power 2 therefore, 9 stress components and there will be corresponding 9 strain components. I think we already understood that what are those 9 stress component and 9 strain components and they are related by means of this 81 constant. This is actually a fourth order stiffness tensor which will have 3 to the power 4 that means 81 uh, independent elastic constants. We have just now understood what are those independent elastic constants why it is 81 because 9 stress components are related to 9 strain components by means of these 81 independent elastic constants. So, this is the stiffness matrix C and this is the compliance matrix S okay. and in general it requires 81 independent elastic constants to fully characterize a material. Now, when you say anisotropic elasticity again I am reiterating anisotropic means the properties are direction dependent. Okay. The properties of the materials are different in different directions and in such material in order to relate the stresses to the strains we need this 81 independent elastic constant and if we expand the stresses and strains by using this index notations and the stiffness tensor this looks like this is how it looks like. Okay. These are the 81 elastic constants, independent elastic constants, this is 9 strain components and these are the 9 stress components. Okay. So, now we know that uh, just now we have discussed that equality of cross shear, but in general term that uh, from the 9 stress components conditions of rotational equilibrium whatever way the stresses are distributed in a deformable solid they must satisfy uh, equilibrium equations. Okay. So, conditions of rotational uh, in order to satisfy the rotational equilibrium that is the moment equilibrium finally, we get the equality of cross shear that means sigma ij is equal to sigma j i and similarly for strain epsilon ij is equal to epsilon j i for i is not equal to j this is nothing but what we have learned uh, in your solid mechanics as equality of cross shear. So, but, uh, for moment equilibrium of course, in the in the absence of body moments uh, that the uh, cross shears are equal and therefore, the 9 stress and 
uh, stress components uh, actually there are 6 independent okay, and therefore, it becomes a symmetric stress and strain tensors. So, 6 components of strains are related to 6 components of stresses by means of this 36 independent elastic constants. Okay. So, in uh, as the stress and stresses and strains are reduced from 9 to 6 therefore, the elements of stiffness matrix also gets reduced to 36 from 81. Okay. So, we need actually for symmetric stress and strain tensors we need 36 independent elastic constants to characterize the material. Okay. Now, uh, we use contracted notation okay. here uh, instead of writing this C 1 1 1 1 we write this as C 1 1 then 1 1 2 2 is written as 1 2 and so on and so forth and therefore, we write this in contracted notation. Similarly, the stresses are also written in contracted notation sigma 1 1 sigma 2 2 sigma 3 3 are written as sigma 1 sigma 2 sigma 3 like this. So, in contracted notation this is how the stresses are related to 6 components of stresses are actually related to 6 components of strains by means of 36 uh, independent elastic constants. This C matrix is actually called the stiffness matrix and if you take inverse of this then you get taking inverse of this we get this S matrix that means, strains are related to stresses and this S matrix is called the compliance matrix. Okay. So, in an anisotropic body the stress strain relationship is given by this and suppose we want to uh, characterize an anisotropic material we need to know this 36 independent elastic constants then only we can correlate the stresses to the corresponding strains and vice versa. Okay. However, from the energy consideration we can show that uh, this for uh, elastic material linearly elastic, linearly elastic material this stiffness matrix is also symmetric that means, C i j is equal to C j i how we can actually write down the work done per unit volume if we apply a stress along a particular direction we can write that half into stress into strain is the work done that means, the strain energy per unit volume. Okay. You know that if this is the stress versus strain the area under this curve is actually the strain energy stored per unit volume because in the load deflection curve it is the work done and load per uh, unit area is the stress and uh, deflection per unit length is the strain. Therefore, this is nothing but the uh, work done per unit volume. So, we can write this stress in terms of strain and we get this and if we take to successive differentiation once with respect to epsilon i and then with respect to epsilon j we get this. Similarly, we can write this uh, sigma j in terms of uh, uh, c j i and epsilon i and we take second uh, two successive differentiation with respect to epsilon j and epsilon i we get c j i. Now, that order, order of differentiation is immaterial here and therefore, c j i is equal to c i j and similarly, we can also prove that that S i j is equal to S j i. The net result is that the stiffness matrix is and the compliance matrix is they are actually symmetric. Okay. Therefore, as a consequence of this symmetric uh, instead of 36 now we need 21 independent elastic constants. Okay. Because the matrix is symmetric we actually need 21 independent elastic constants to characterize a anisotropic material. Okay. So, what that means is that if we really want to characterize an, an, an anisotropic material that means, we want to know subjected to load or subjected to stresses what will be the strains we need to know this, this uh, 21 independent elastic constants and you can understand that determination of this 21 independent elastic constant is a huge task. Okay. Like what are those elements in the beginning I have uh, we have discussed that this is nothing but the, the functions of material properties, but of course, we have had our discussion with respect to isotropic material. Now, we will see how this discussion actually goes ahead uh, I mean we go ahead with this uh, for anisotropic material. Now, what happens is uh, these anisotropic materials are also known as triclinic materials. Fortunately, in many materials there exists planes of material property symmetry. Okay. What is actually planes of material property symmetry? Suppose, you have a material and with respect to certain plane 
the material properties are symmetric. Say for example, suppose we define uh, say this x 1, x 2, x 3 or we can write x y z okay? and then suppose this 1 2 or the x y this plane is the plane of material property symmetry. That means, if you rotate the object with ref respect to this plane that means, if you just reflect this okay, then there will be no change in material property. The properties are symmetric with respect to this plane. Okay. So, this if x 3 x 3 is nothing but the normal to this plane is the plane of material property generally a plane is represented by its surface normal. So, if x 3 is the plane of material property symmetry that means, the stiffness matrix C i j is invariant with respect to an inversion of x 3 axis. That means, instead of x 3 suppose we just invert it and we write x 3 dash there will be no change in the material property. That means, the stiffness matrix or compliance matrix do not change. Okay. Now, we know that if you want to have coordinate transformation from x 1, x 2, x 3 to x 1, x 2, x 3 dash or say x y z to x y z dash. Okay. The direction cosine matrix is given by this. What is direction cosine matrix? We know that is that we use this for coordinate transformation. Okay. Now, this is nothing but the cos theta cos of angle between x and x dash. Okay. Therefore, it is 0, it is 1 and then this is x and y dash this is also 0, okay. but only when it comes to uh, z and z dash it is 180 degree therefore, it is minus 1. So, this is the direction cosine matrix for uh, while changing from x y z to x dash y dash z dash or x 1 x 2 x 3 to uh, x 1 x 2 x 3 dash. Okay. So, suppose we define the stresses with respect to at this point we define the stresses with respect to x y z and with respect to x dash y dash z dash. What is x dash y dash z dash? This is x dash, this is uh, y dash, this is z dash. I mean x and x dash remain same, y and y dash remain same, only thing z and z dash are 180 degree apart. Okay? So, suppose the stresses are defined with respect to, stresses and strains are defined, this is with respect to untransformed that means, x y z and this is with respect to transform that is x dash y dash z dash. In this case x dash y dash do coincide with x y only z dash is rotated by 180 degree. Now, these are the stresses, but the stiffness matrix remains same this is invariant. Okay. That is why we are telling that this uh, uh, plane this x 1 x 2 plane is a plane of material property symmetry. Now, we know how to transform stresses for rotated axis. Okay. So, if we write the stress strain relation with respect to x y z, this is what is the stress strain relationship. If we write the stress strain relationship with respect to x dash y dash z dash, this is what is the stress strain relationship. This is x y z, this is also x dash y dash this is z dash. Okay. Only thing that do not change here is this stiffness matrix remains same. Okay. Now, we perform the stress transformation. So, we all know how to do the stress transformation. So, we write the transform stresses in terms of the you know the untransformed stresses by multiplying it twice by the direction cosine matrix and therefore, what we get is this. Similarly, we perform the strain transformation and we get this. So, we can see in this transformation only these two stresses change. Okay. In fact, they change their signs. Okay. All other stresses remain same. Same is the case with the strains. Okay. Therefore, now if we write because sigma x equal to sigma x dash, it does not change. Okay. We know what is sigma x in the untransformed sigma x is nothing but c 1 1 epsilon x plus c 1 2 epsilon y plus c 1 3 epsilon z c 1 4 gamma y z 
C15 gamma Zx plus C16 gamma Xy. And what is sigma X dash? C remains same, but now these are the transform strains epsilon Y dash C13 epsilon Z dash C14 gamma Y Z dash C15 gamma Z X dash plus C16 gamma X Y dash. And we use the relation that actually gamma Y Z prime is nothing but we use the relation that gamma Y Z prime is nothing but gamma Y Z. Okay. Also gamma Z X prime is nothing but minus gamma Z X and use this in this relation and equate this we get this. Okay. Therefore, if, if these two are same then only way it is possible is that the C14 and C15 are 0. Therefore, this leads to that C14 and C15 has to be 0. In the similar way we can use sigma y is equal to sigma y prime that leads to C24 and C25 is equal to 0. Sigma z is equal to sigma z prime lead to C34 and C35 is equal to 0 and tau xy is equal to tau xy prime leads to C46 and C56 equal to 0. As a consequence of existence of uh, one plane of material property symmetry what we get is that out of this 21 independent elastic constants 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 becomes 0. Okay. Now, this is a simple way of uh, showing that the existence of one plane of material property symmetry leads to 8 of uh, the 21 independent elastic constants 0. This could also be done by uh, tensorial transformation, stiffness transformation. If somebody is interested you can go and uh, check this, but our, 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 uh, our uh, focus here is to understand the what happens uh, in the therefore, we are not doing it here just we have shown with a simple stress transformation that the because the stiffnesses do not change therefore, we could show that 8 out of the 21 independent elastic constants are 0. This the similar thing could be proved using tensorial transformation also. Okay. Therefore, such a material where there is one plane of material property symmetry which is known as monoclinic material for this the stiffness matrix consists of only 13 independent elastic cons I mean 13 terms okay, 13 independent elastic constants. Okay. Similarly, the uh, uh, compliance matrix will also have 13 independent terms. Okay. So, for a monoclinic materials we need 13 independent elastic constants to characterize. In a fully anisotropic material we need 21 independent elastic constants to characterize, but in a monoclinic material we need 13 independent elastic constants to characterize. An example of a monoclinic material is feldspar. Okay. And you can clearly see that these, these terms were non-zero in the case of fully anisotropic material these 6 terms as well as these 2 terms which becomes 0 and the reason is because there is one plane of material property symmetry. Okay. Now, suppose in addition to one plane of material property symmetry, okay, there is another plane of material property symmetry which is perpendicular uh, to that first plane of material property symmetry. That means, there are two mutually perpendicular planes of material property symmetry. In such case, it could be shown that it also leads to that the third plane is also a plane of material property symmetry. That means, three mutually perpendicular planes of material property symmetry and such materials are called orthotropic materials. So, what is an orthotropic material where we have three mutually perpendicular planes of material property symmetry. In fact, there are two mutually perpendicular planes of material property symmetry automatically leads to the third plane also to be a plane of material property symmetry and it is an orthotropic material. Now, let us see what happens there. We have just now seen that existence of one plane of material property symmetry leads to reduction of independent elastic constants from 21 to 13. Now, suppose earlier we have taken this say x y plane as the plane of material property symmetry. right? Now, suppose in addition to that we also take 
x z plane that means, this plane this x z plane is also a plane of material property symmetry. Therefore, there are two mutually perpendicular planes of material property symmetry. Okay. I have written both the notations here, but this, uh, this could be x 1, x 2, x 3. I am also simultaneously writing x, y, z. Okay. So, now what happens is because this, this uh, earlier this x y was a plane of material property symmetry. So, we did this inversion that means, z was given this z prime 180 degree up okay, rotation. Now, because this is also a material property symmetry therefore, with respect to this plane there is no change in the material properties therefore, y is now moved to y dash y prime which is 180 degree apart. Okay. So, if y is moved to y dash what is the direction cosines only the angle between y and y dash is actually 180 degree. So, this is minus 1. So, this is the direction cosine matrix. Okay. So, under this the stiffness matrix again remains same stiffness and compliance remain same. I am not going into details of this like the previous case if we perform the stress transformation we can perform the stress transformation. So, the transform stresses are related to the untransformed stresses like this when we multiply this by the direction cosines matrix untransformed stresses twice and we get this. Okay. Similarly, the strain transformation these are the transformed st strains untransformed strains okay. and of course, uh, under this transformation the C and S matrix do not change. Okay. Now, you can see here that still sigma x prime remains same as sigma x sigma y prime also remains same as sigma y okay. and sigma z prime also does not change okay. when there are two mutually perpendicular planes of material property symmetry. And when we use this the sigma x is equal to sigma x prime like the previous case that as a consequence of this what we get is you can just try this you will get C 1 6 as 0 sigma y is equal to sigma y prime makes C 2 6 equal to 0 how this becomes 0 just like the earlier case that means, we will have two equations where only uh, two terms will have negative signs and therefore, that forces that C 1 6 equal to 0 C 2 6 equal to 0. Similarly, sigma z is equal to sigma z prime leads to C 3 6 equal to 0 tau x y is equal to tau x y prime leads to C 4 5 is equal to 0. So, as a consequence of having another perpendicular planes of plane of material property symmetry that means, we have two mutually per perpendicular planes of material property symmetry that leads to four more uh, elements of the stiffness matrix to become 0. Okay. So, this is how the stiffness matrix looks like for an orthotropic material where we have two mutually, mutually perpendicular planes of material property symmetry. Of course, you can show that if you take the third plane also as a plane of material property symmetry that does not make any further changes and therefore, it automatically guarantees that the third plane is also a plane of mutually uh, I mean plane of material property symmetry. So, the stiffness matrix looks like this and now four more uh, elastic constants becomes 0 four more uh, terms of this matrix becomes 0 therefore, we have nine independent elastic constants okay. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and this is symmetric this part is anyway symmetric C 1 to C 2 1 is same. Okay. So, for an orthotropic material we need 9 independent elastic constants to characterize the materials that means, if we want to uh, characterize an orthotropic material we need this 9 somehow we need to determine this 9 elastic constants. So, you can see from 21 it is 9. So, life is uh, easier I mean we can actually we need to only determine 9 independent elastic constants. Example is unidirectional lamina rolled steel. What is rolled steel? See I mean uh, the crystals are actually anisotropic, but in a material basically the crystals are randomly oriented and therefore, we get most of the cases the isotropic properties, but in some cases like in when rolling of steel we actually uh, uh, provide some preferred directions of the crystals and therefore, it develops orthotropy. If you take a roll still actually it behaves orthotropically in the direction of rolling it is much stronger and stiffer compared to the other two directions. Okay. Now, suppose in an orthotropic material what is an orthotropic material you have three mutually perpendicular planes of material property symmetry. Suppose one of the transverse plane is 
such that the in that plane the properties are independent of direction. Okay. So, in this case suppose uh, this is an orthotropic uh, lamina okay. that means plane 1 2 plane 2 3 and plane 1 3 are the 3 mutually perpendicular planes of material property symmetry. Now, suppose the plane 2 3 that means this plane is isotropic in this the material properties are independent of directions. I have shown here that in whether it is uh, y z or y, z, y dash y prime z prime that means, if you make a rotation with theta that the, uh, the properties do not change. If you take want to see in a simple term what does it mean that means, suppose if you take this 2 3 plane in this 2 3 plane the Young's modulus in this direction, Young's modulus in this direction, Young's modulus in any other direction remains same. Similarly, the portions, uh, similarly the other properties also. Okay. So, this is called transversely isotropic. If in an orthotropic material in one of the transverse planes the material properties are independent of directions that means isotropic these are called transversely isotropic material. Now, example in this case say 2 3 is the plane of isotropy. So, we can actually find out the transform stresses okay, for a rotation in this uh, uh, in this 2 3 plane by multiplying by the proper rotation matrix we know how to do this stress transformation and then we can show that as a result of this that some of the terms are like C 1 2 becomes equal to C 1 3, C 2 2 becomes C 2 3 and C 4 4 becomes a function of 2 2 and 2 3 and 3 3 and 2 3 like this. Therefore, number of independent elastic constants in a uh, transversal isotropic materials becomes 5 okay? because uh, in orthotropic there are 9. Now, out of that some of the terms becomes dependent and therefore, it becomes 9. Now, why it has why physically if you want to see that means, in that uh, in the 2 3 plane if you see in the 2 3 plane because the it is independent of direction therefore, 2 and 3 are actually mutually interchangeable. So, what happens is if you see that this is actually 1 3 therefore, 1 2 and 1 3 are same because 2 3 is the plane of isotropy. Okay. Similarly, this is actually C 3 3 now because 2 3 is the plane of isotropy C 2 2 and C 3 3 are same. Now, actually C 2 2 and C 3 3 are the stiffness along the direction 2 and 3 they are same. Similarly, in the plane 2 3 uh, this, uh, uh, this becomes a function of C 2 2 and C 2 3. Okay. Uh, this is nothing but a, uh, if you see that this is nothing but a measure of the shear modulus and you know in isotropic material the shear modulus is a function of Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio this is actually reflected here. So, in any case so the existence of one plane of uh, transverse isotropy leads to uh, uh, as a consequence of that uh, the number of independent elastic constants that is required to characterize a, a the material remain it becomes 5. So, in a transverse isotropic material we need 5 independent elastic constants. For example, an unidirectional lamina where the fibers are arranged in a square array. Okay. Suppose, you have a lamina where the fibers are arranged like this in a square regularly spaced. Therefore, naturally in this plane, so it will have suppose this is the direction 1 and say this is direction 1 and say this is direction 2 and say this is direction 3. So, uh, in the 2 3 plane you can see that it will have same properties in the direction 2 or direction 3 or any other direction. Therefore, this happens to be a transverse plane of transverse isotropy and therefore, this is an example of transverse isotropic material. Okay. But if the fibers are not uh, uh, really arranged regularly it may not be the plane of transverse isotropy. If all the planes are planes of material property symmetry, then it becomes an isotropic material. We all know what is an isotropic material. Therefore, all the planes are this could be again proved considering that all the planes are planes of material property symmetry. What happens is finally, only two independent elastic constants remain all other becomes dependent. Therefore, in an isotropic material uh, we have C 1 1 and C 1 2 and all others are actually like this is C 1 1 see C 1 1 2 2 3 3 becomes all 1 1 that means, 
in all the directions 1, 2 and 3 the material properties are same. Okay. Similarly, C, this becomes C 1, 2 okay. so, and these are dependent on C 1, 1 and C 1, 2. So, only two independent elastic constants and we know for isotropic what are those two actually Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio okay. and the shear modulus is a function of Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. So, in an isotropic material we need only two independent elastic constants and uh, it is much easier to actually characterize a material. Okay. So, uh, now what we have learned is if you just look at the stiffness or compliance matrix, I, I, am, I have written here the compliance matrix, you can write the stiffness matrix also, what exactly it means. Now, we have been talking about the number of turns, let us see what exactly it means. Suppose, uh, we have a component where say we apply, say we apply suppose this is direction 1 and say this is direction 2, 3 mutually perpendicular direction. Okay. Suppose we apply only load along 1 say that leads to only sigma 1 that means we apply only sigma 1. Now, if it is an anisotropic material look at the material characterization what does it mean subjected to these stresses we can actually find out what are the strains. So, because this S11, S12, S13 all these are non-zero therefore, even if only sigma 1 is applied suppose all others are 0 that will lead to all the strain components epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3, shear strain gamma 2, 3, gamma 1, 3, gamma 2, 1, 2. That means, even if we have applied only a normal stress along this that will of course, leads to normal strain along 1 epsilon 1 that is quite understood that will also lead to normal strains along 2 epsilon 2 that is also we know because of Poisson's effect. It will also lead to epsilon 3 along 3 that is also we understand because of Poisson's effect. Okay. In addition it will also lead to shear strain okay, in 1, 2, 2, 3 and 3, 1 planes. That means, if I just uh, write under this what will be the deformed shape. Uh, maybe the deformed shape will be that means all the planes actually are also experience shear strain and they, they are they therefore uh, they gets it's it's distorted okay that means but the applied stress is only one normal stress okay therefore in an anisotropic material all the stresses are actually coupled all the stresses are coupled to the all the strains okay now, if you look at this, what is S11? S11 actually tells us if you apply sigma 1, what is epsilon 1? Okay. That means, for a stress along 1, what is the strain along 1? Similarly, S22 tells us if you apply a stress along 2, what is the strain along 2? And similarly, S3 for 3. So, these 3 are actually uh, are the extensional stiffness, these are extensional stiffness. Now, what is S12? S12 is if you apply a stress along, uh, if you apply a stress along 1, what is the strain along 2 or vice versa? If you apply a stress along 1, sigma 1, normal stress along 1, what is the normal strain along 2 is given by S12. Similarly, if we apply a stress, normal stress along 1, what is the normal strain along 3 is given by S13. And similarly, S23 is the coupling between normal stress along 2 and the strain along 3. So, therefore, these are called extension extension coupling. Okay. These are called extension extension coupling. Now, what is S44? S44 is if we apply a stress in the plane shear stress tau 2 3, what is the corresponding shear strain in the plane 2 3? Similarly, for 1 3, this is S55, for 1 2 S66. Six, six. So, these are actually shear stiffness okay these are shear stiffness and then since s45 is non zero it means that even if you apply a shear stress in the plane 2 3 that will also lead to a shear strain on the other planes okay if you apply a shear along 1 2 
that will not only uh, shear stress along 1, 2 that will not only lead to shear strain along 1, 2 it will also lead to shear strain along 2, 3 and 3, 1. Therefore, these are called shear shear coupling like extension extension coupling. And in addition to that application of normal stress leads to shear strain and application of shear stress lead to normal strain and vice versa. Okay? So, these are given by these are due to these terms and these are called shear extension coupling. Therefore, in a fully anisotropic material all the stresses and strains are coupled, okay. but what happens is if there exists a one plane of symmetry see some of the coupling terms goes to 0. Still there is shear extension coupling, but some of these are not there because of the existence of one plane of material property symmetry in that plane there is shear extension coupling these two shear extension couplings are actually uh, they uh, become 0. Okay. Similarly, these shear extension couplings become 0, but still there are shear extension couplings. Okay. So, as a result of existence of one plane of material property symmetry some of the shear extension coupling and some of the shear shear coupling becomes 0. Okay. Similarly, in an orthotropic material there is no shear extension coupling. Okay. That means, if you apply normal stress that will lead to normal strains, if you apply shear stress that will lead to shear strain there is no shear extension coupling. Okay. Also, there is no shear shear coupling, okay. there is no shear shear coupling. If we apply shear stress in 1 2 plane that will lead to shear strain in 1 2 plane, it will not have shear strain in 2 3 or 3 1 plane. Okay. So, in an orthotropic material shear extension coupling is not there, shear shear coupling is not there, but extension extension coupling is there that is because of the Poisson's effect. Okay. And in a transversely isotropic material one plane actually behaves as isotropic and therefore, in that plane you can have the relationship between the uh, elastic constants like you can see that the shear stiffness is actually a function of uh, S 2 2 and S 2 3. Okay. Like you know that for an isotropic material the modulus of rigidity is actually a function of Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio, okay. but uh, I mean this is an orthotropic material where we have one plane of transverse isotropy and therefore, that particular plane uh, behaves isotropically. Okay. So, what we have learnt is that we understood what is uh, the planes of material property symmetry uh, and uh, due to the existence of planes of material property symmetry as a consequence of existence of planes of material property symmetry uh, some of the coupling terms becomes 0 okay. uh, and therefore, if there is a single one plane of material property symmetry then it is called monoclinic and number of independent elastic constants required is 13. If there are two mutually perpendicular planes of material property symmetry that automatically tells us that there is a third plane of material property third uh, perpendicular plane of material property symmetry that is called orthotropic materials and we have only 9 independent elastic constants. And in addition to that if there is one plane of uh, uh, one transverse plane of isotropy then it is it is called transversely isotropic and we need only five independent elastic constants. Okay. So, uh, we understood the what is an isotropy in brief and what are the uh, different kinds of material uh, like orthotropic material, monoclinic material and transversely isotropic material and finally, isotropic material. Okay. So, we will continue in the next class based on what are the engineering constants for orthotropic material.